yet another Saturday and of course Captured by Women is coming right to your screen, to your home. I'm sure you're comfortable wherever you are. Last week Petra was not here but she joins us today so we'll find out where she was and she'll be telling us. But of course we're happy to join you. We're proudly sponsored by Yamvita, a delicious way to grow. I hope last week you got that pack of Yamvita to share with the family, children. If mommy and daddy are not buying it, let them do the so now, now, now. But Petra, where were you last week? We well, missed you. I, I missed you too. <laughs> I was up north mm -hmm. in Tamale, and so I want to say hello to all the people in Tamale. Um, TV3 is really big in the three yes. northern regions, and especially in Tamale where I went. I was keynote speaker for um, Comfort. Okay. Um, it was the graduation of their MasterCard um, Foundation Scholars Program. Okay. So about 120 young ladies mm. coming out of various tertiary institutions, and it was their celebration. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Oh, that's yes, nice. And so hello to our viewers yeah. in Tamale. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. But of course, this week mm. we have interesting things. We've had floods. We've had the Metro telling us that the media agency is not doing enough to put mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. the messages. We'll be talking about mm -hmm. that, I guess, mm -hmm. to find out if it's the media's fault or maybe Metro just gives the information a bit too late. Too late. Or, yeah, what really yeah. is it? And then, of course, we'll, we'll talk, talk about AMA and its plans to also mm -hmm. help with this whole flooding situation. Yeah. We'll see where they've gotten with that. Mm -hmm. Then what else will we be talking about, Petra? Well, there's the 15-month old ban on small-scale mining that um, the president has indicated that we'll finally be seeing some lifting. Um, I'm sure there are people in the public who don't want it to be lifted, but <laughs> there's also the livelihood of the small-scale miners that we need to consider, and the whole economy generally. So there's been a roadmap that has, has um, been outlined, and we're going to have um, a member of the sm Small-Scale Miners Association with us today to talk to us about their side of the story mm. and what they think about all of the engagements that has, have gone on. So... It does hope to very be a very interesting show. Yes, and on lifestyle, we'll discuss how wearing high heels and holding very heavy bags can impact our spine. We have a very exciting show ahead, so please stay with us. We'll be right back. In 1979, Ali Maziri delivered a series of lectures that culminated in the publishing of a book, The African Condition. In that book, he highlights six paradoxes, and one of those paradoxes is the Garden of Eden in decay. Essentially, he describes the fact that even though Africa was one of the first parts of the world to experience civilization, Africa has not truly become habitable for its own citizens. This past week, we had another incident of flooding. Interestingly, the Metro Service claims that the warnings are consistently put out, but the media fails to publicize and extend these notices to the public. And so we went out to get your views on what you think about the media services. Do we trust them when they publish notices? Do we pay attention to those notices? And maybe is the media to blame of why the notices don't go out? We'll hear from the public and we'll come back. I just analyze the uh, season we have and then consider it. So I don't really have a valid information or a basic source to get my information about the weather, how the weather will be in the day. Me sorry, me plan it. Say I be a so be talk and I so talk. I say me to me pray. Say I be a when I be a see a kusua. Me to me pray. You look at the sky and when the weather is dark then it means maybe it will rain or something. If the weather is cloudy I can predict that maybe there will be a rain. So that will be my judgment about the weather. I don't rely on any agency. Um, luckily for me um, I have a weather app and so I just check it. Just It's, it's automatic so it, tells, it gives me notifications of how the weather will be like. Sometimes you know reporting and you show what TV so weather uh, forecast you know? and also sometimes in you know, it it's me a yeah, juma sometimes you know, so yeah you share you we know, share one side that what you know, say ben come so say no a muna what you know, say where the ensure better but when you first say i will see and talk sometimes it's me yes sir sometimes it's so over corner and see only to me talk i know that uh, we have the meteorologists but i think they are not reliable the last time, uh, they predicted wrongly, and the, what, the, uh, the, the rain got up with the former president, John Dramani Mahama. So really, I don't, take, I don't take them serious. Welcome back. 
the views are quite diverse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for one, don't typically pay attention to weather notices or weather reports in Ghana. Mm. But when I'm outside of here, I take particular, I pay particular attention to it. Um, I wonder why. But I think it's because, really, over time, it seems to be the same old thing. We've had issues with them saying one thing, but you step out on the, in the day and it doesn't happen. So I guess we felt like, oh, maybe someone is just putting just Playing words games, together yeah. and mm -hmm. copying the same thing, copy and paste kind of life, which we're used to. So why bother? I mean, if it's going to rain, I'll see the sign in the sky and try and <laughs> huddle if I have to mm. or find shelter yeah. somewhere. And then again, the point is for us, I think as Ghanaians or Africans, we become laid back with the problem is if even it's going to rain, you've told me, I've heard, what are you going to do about it for me? It all comes back to me. I have to find a solution for myself. Mm. Then I would also find a reason to help myself. Mm. Then at the end of the day, I What's become my own meteorological mm -hmm. service. Why do I need to hear from them before I act? Mm. And I think that's where we need to really diversify because like you rightly said, when we step out of Ghana, we're so eager to find out what's the weather condition going to be like so that I dress appropriately. I even take the appropriate clothing I need to do so in mm. the other country. I think the meteorological agency just needs to sit up and you know make sure they're putting out credible information mm -hmm. consistently so that now we can pay attention I mean, but on I the flip side mm -hmm. okay Rosman, you should check so i mean for I me i think that this is purely a blame game on the part of the meteor service right why are they blaming the media first of all from what the director said it's uh as if the notices went out late first of all and why do you blame the media my my point is what has been the pattern of the engagement with the media mm. has it been ad hoc or it's been structured right you know, this is an annual thing that happens every year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be proactive, you engage the media way ahead so that they start sending out information about how to prepare for flats, to, um, you know, to issue weather alerts so that people will know and be advised. Mm. But to say that the media didn't do uh, their part, I think it's, it's a blame game that must not be tolerated. After all, we've seen past examples of organizations both in the public and the private sector who have engaged the media fruitfully in so many social issues you know and this is a, a matter of life and death so to say that the media disseminated the information late i think it's lame mm. they think, should be yeah. proactive <laughs> and engage the media ahead of time yeah. it so that's be a very um, outmoded maybe mentality of how mm. to engage the media mm. because the media is not what it used to be 50 years ago mm. it's not just one stage broadcaster anymore exactly there's so many radio stations so many tv stations the social media there are ways of engaging mm. the, the the population outside of traditional mm -hmm. means that i feel that generally all government agencies should adapt some are doing very well mm -hmm. but when it comes to weather we need to have the information put out there. Of course, the media should support. Mm -hmm. But the thinking that it's not one TV station we're reaching out mm -hmm. to. But Petra, that's why there are media associations. Mm -hmm. We have the Ghana in, uh, uh, Independent Broadcast Association. Association. We have yes. the National Media Commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the umbrella agencies. So they, they media can agencies exactly. the information. work that's with true. them. And they sort of um, are the uh, agencies that partner or that head the media. Mm. So once you work with them, it's like you're reaching out through so, yeah, one uh, channel. True. You're reaching out to about 100. True. You That's know. what so I was even going to before because I don't really think their claim about this um, media agency is not putting the information out I there think, with agencies. It's, because it's, it's, it's not that. Even when they do, because I for one, I mean when you work TV3, we oftentimes will update you on what is happening with by way of weather. But even the timing of them bringing out this information, I always wonder why you bring the weather patterns let's say, and it has to carry mm. for 24 hours until they realize it's going to change a bit then they try, no, try but, and change but, it no, no. but at the same time media agencies are business businesses mm -hmm. they've got their content for the day and so if you just jump on when someone has planned their content let's say i'm showing you a movie from 9 to 11 and you tell me there's going to be a flood and all of a sudden you want me to change exactly. that and find it somewhere in the middle of the program it may not also suit the media agency's kind of you know plan so if they collaborate better then they'll know exactly. when it fits in exactly. and when it will be appropriate to if send they, out if they certain, partner you know, ahead of important time information. the media would quickly disseminate if there's a structured relationship mm -hmm. but if yeah. it's ad hoc, ad hoc it's pointless but isn't this possibly a reflection of our general attitude and appreciation of weather um, uh, phenomena because really if we as individuals don't pay attention to the weather the media doesn't pay attention weather reports nobody's watching everybody's because changing the so channel don't so. even pay attention. <laughs> but anyway on that note guys we've been spinning about the meteorological agency and the fact that they're saying the media doesn't put out the information with the agency it deserves i guess you've had your own take on that we hope that at least we as citizens can start to ta put them to task and then maybe 
maybe the media will put it up with the agency and the meteorological agency will also bring the information out with the agency it deserves we'll take a break we'll be back stay with us So today on Big Bang One, we're going to be discussing the lifting of the ban on small-scale mining, all in the wake of trying to fight illegal mining, Galamse, as is popularly known. We are joined today by Mr. Mike Gizzo. He is the Director of Research and Development at the Ghana Small Scale Miners Association. And he's going to be delving deep into it to find out what they have to say about the president's outline of the roadmap. Good afternoon, Mr. Mike. Good afternoon. So, I mean, small scale miners, we know the issues. We won't yeah. go back to that. We know how yes. far we've come. But what is your association's stance on the fact that the president has outlined a roadmap or he has given this statement? Do you think you're really involved in it and you understand exactly what the timelines for this roadmap is? Yes, thanks a lot. Um, it's something we've been waiting for mm. for some time now. So to us, it was a timely statement that the president made. And uh, the president made reference to the regular interactions that we've been having with the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining. Right. So we are into it mm. fully. Uh, we are also against Galamse, and we've contributed so much towards the fight. And uh, we think that it's about time the ban be lifted for legitimate small-scale miners mm -hmm. to go back to work. What the president said was that there are some things that are left to be covered before the ban will be lifted. But we also came out to say that we need specific timelines and mm -hmm. definitive time frames mm -hmm. so that we can also make projections. Because uh, mining is a capital-intensive venture. Mm -hmm. An excavator will cost you not less than three hundred thousand mm. dollars. You go for a loan to acquire two, three excavators, and all of a sudden, you just have to pack and be in the house without any alternative source of livelihood and stuff. So we are going through a lot. That is why we are saying that as we've been in the house for uh, fifteen months now, we've lost our entire investment, and even restart capital is also a challenge to us. So we want them to come out in a very definitive form this year this month that day mm. so that we can also make the necessary projections my confusion now is you say for let's say the 15 months there has been some engagement so mm. in that engagement don't you already know the timelines that have been put to these activities the president talked about uh, what we were informed mm. was that the president has given us some targets okay so we have to try and meet those set targets yeah. and we are still in the process of meeting them you know okay. so they haven't given us any definitive timeline right. for the lifting of the ban okay. just that we know that we are in the process and getting very close, close to the to edge it. yeah mm. so are you planning to proactively seek audience with um, you know with the relevant people that you've been engaging with all these while to understand and have the definite timelines that you you desire yes uh, even um, today this morning we met the executive secretary to the uh, committee on illegal mining and we also uh, gave out our concerns to him okay. that they should reconsider that aspect for us because it's a good news to hear that uh, after so mm -hmm. <laughs> long a time the ban is to be lifted but as i said we want them to come out in a different form or manner so that we can also make projections towards the future so we will keep engaging them now if you look at the roadmap hmm. and what has been done uh, the formation of the district mining committees yes. is over now uh, the training program at the university of mines for both legal and illegal miners is also ongoing hmm. we have our members there as i talk to you now what is left is the vetting process the vetting of the licenses and also the fiscal inspection of the various mining, mining sites, sites. Right. and one thing they mentioned was also the tracking of devices so these two are the ones we are waiting for and we just want them to uh, speed it up uh, in a speedy way we can now achieve what is said before us mm -hmm. as given by the government sorry to cut you there's a very important part of the roadmap that you may have um, not considered and that's the issue the impact on the environment yes and regaining the the forestry and everything so i'm sure there's there's a portion of it where they've highlighted afforestation as a key 
area, which I feel that for most Ghanaians, that's one of the key issues. Yes. Because water bodies are affected, the forestry reserves are affected, all of that is affected. What's your association doing in line with that? Because we, we have conversations around it all the yes. time about the impact this has on the environment. Is that part of the engagement that you've been involved in so far? Yes, it is. We think that uh, we've been caught in the crossfire of something we initiated uh -huh. because okay. we started fighting against this Galamse mm -hmm. issue way back in 2013. So for one to go through the bureaucratic procedure of acquiring the license mm -hmm. signifies the person's willingness to do the right thing. So we, the legitimate ones, we are not at fault, but we thought it wise to help in achieving the set targets of the president and for that matter secure the future for uh, generations unborn. We have the pre-ban mm -hmm. and the post-ban policies and that is what we don't want people to merge because there will be a conflict. Mm -hmm. If we are saying that we reclaim all the lands, the degraded ones, and also restore all the river bodies before legitimate miners who through no fault of DS, <laughs> you know, these things came about, then it will be suicidal on behalf of government and also for us mm -hmm. as, uh, as, as an association. What we think is that it we need Sorry, to let me just ask, is that because you feel it will be a very long process? Oh, it will yes, take a very it, long it will, time? because okay. the multilateral mining integrated project, mm -hmm. which seeks to, you know, guide government as to what is to be done, it's a five-year policy mm -hmm. statement. Okay. So we can't be in the house for five, five years. years. And mm -hmm. even after the five years, I think that we wouldn't have covered everything. Right. But I'm just curious, in all this, when the association sits back, yes, you, you, you know, were very cooperative with government for 15 months to stay at home and not be on the site. But now they're lifting the ban, you're going back, and we know that the activities of the illegal miners sort of happens when legal people are on the ground. They only take advantage of your work and then get back to it. Do you think... Or are you convinced that lifting the ban at this point in time, apart from you getting your jobs back, is going to help the fight against Galamse? One thing that I want all Ghanaians to take note is that uh, our absence mm. is also a challenge mm. because our presence deters mm. the uh, illegal ones from operating. That's a our, really our concern, oh yes, our concessions are given to us. Uh, you know, we operate on site-specific concessions mm -hmm. with your coordinates and stuff. I am in Accra, mm -hmm. but I go to the hinterland because of this work. Mm -hmm. Now I'm no more there. I've asked all my workers to go back. The place is left ajar. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that the people over there, they just need a pickaxe and a shovel and stuff. They go to the concession that has been given to me to mine. So if I'm there, they cannot do that. Right. But in my absence, they are free to do whatever they, 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 they want to. So we think that going back is also even a, a plus mm -hmm. towards the fight against uh, uh, Galamse. So not just going back, mm -hmm. but also going back to aid in the fight against Galamse. Well, we have our tax force in place. Right. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And our tax force will still continue to help government in achieving that. We have our monitoring team. Uh, the Interministerial Committee came out with a, a software that is called the Gallum Stop. Yeah. It has been piloted in five mining districts. We have also developed ours, which we call the Optimum RM, RM for Responsible Mining, for internal checks and balances yeah. within our members. And with that software, all you need is just an Android phone. You can assess everything on it and mm -hmm. even if somebody is working at uh, WhatsApp group when well, you've been in Accra you can easily see what is mm -hmm. happening over there. The interministerial committee also have drones. Uh, the training program is ongoing. Operation Vanguard is there. Our tax force is there. Uh, the media coalition, mm -hmm. you know, they are also holding town hall meetings mm -hmm. with the NCC and stuff. So we are yeah. more than prepared. <laughs> Very, but Mr. Maggie, a final word. My question to you is when the small scale association, do you think that this ban was not necessary in the first place? Uh, no, I can't say that for sure yeah. because we are all witnesses to what was mm -hmm. happening. What we are saying is, <laughs> is that we have to look at the problem from various angles. It shouldn't be one sided. Right. There is socioeconomic aspect of the ban. Um, now, as I talk to you now, this is a sector, the uh, small scale subsector, contributes 
37 to uh, for 38 percent of total good production it employs uh, 1.2 million people and affects 8.4 million people producing 1.2 million ounces of gold annually so <laughs> you can imagine what is happening now and on that note we have been speaking to mr mike gizzo he is the director for research and development with the ghana small-scale miners association and they are happy that the ban is soon to be lifted and the roadmap that the president has outlined they are yet to get the exact details but they are ready to cooperate i guess all Ghanaians are happy with that you know information and we all will do our best to make sure we save our country from illegal miners because it does affect the whole environment and maybe our children yet unborn will not come to see anything if this continues so we'll take a break we'll be back with more here on captured by women Welcome back. The show continues with Big Bang 2, and we're discussing the perennial flooding in Accra. Personally, this subject is a very sore one for me, and I'm sure for you as well, because every year we have this conversation, and we seem to achieve very little results. Um, this time, we're discussing the issue from a different angle by revisiting a contract that was signed by the government of Ghana in 2013 with a county group of companies for this company to um, set up a project that would essentially aim at easing the flooding in Accra. In recent times, we've heard very little about the project. So we went to interview the AMA to seek some answers on this issue and to also ask them general questions related to drainage and other issues about the flooding. So let's hear this interview from the AMA. So we are currently at the Accra Metropolitan Assembly and I have with me the acting director in charge of the Waste Management Department of the Assembly, uh, Mr. Victor Corte, to help us understand why we are still seeing floods in certain parts of the capital in spite of the several years of experiences. Good afternoon, Mr. Corte. Welcome to Captured by Women. So since the rains began, there have been flooding I mean, all over Accra, and people have blamed the AMA for this. We are asking why we are still seeing this after so many years of experiences, because one would think that we have enough experiences to help us plan ahead. Yeah. Uh, the issue of sugar children is mostly attitude now, because we have um, some residents or some uh, citizens who do not want to pay for refuse collection services. So what they do is, when clouds gather, they also gather their waste. As soon as they start raining, then they dispose of their waste in their drains. And you know, waste is not soluble in, in water. It's not like sugar or salt. So whatever you put in drain, it will be carried somewhere. And if this happens to block the water channels, then obviously the flow of uh, storm water will be impeded, and that will cause uh, flooding. So flooding is mostly most of the time attitude, attitude now because people throw waste into drains. They throw them in, in uh, tertiary drains and they, do, they get carried into secondary drains and then end up in the storm drain. Those are the primary drains. So when the storm drains are choked, obviously storm water will not be able to flow to the ultimate outfall. Primary drains, secondary drains and tertiary, which ones are the primary ones? Are they the small, small gutters that we find in front of our houses? And the tertiary drains are the small, small gutters, as we call, in front of our homes. And then the secondary drains are the bigger ones, that are the small ones flow into. And then the primary drains are mostly the natural water courses, like the Odo, the Onyashia, and then the Lafa. Who is in charge of these uh, primary drains? The, Ministry of, the Hydro Department of Ministry of Western Housing. They are in charge of the primary drains. Mm. So what has your department been doing all these years, especially towards the rains? Because uh, we are still experiencing the floods and the gutters are still choked. You said uh, you blamed it on attitude and so on. But what are you also doing in terms of desilting them to make sure that the water flows? Yeah, as city managers, in the event of flooding, by all means, we will take the, the bashing. But we have, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, drainage, it's a multi-stakeholder um, sector. We have a uh, Western housing, the assemblies, and some other 
agencies. So it depends upon uh, the multitude of flooding or the affected drains. So well, as city managers, we have to coordinate the activities of all these uh, stakeholders so that we make sure our water channels are cleared. If uh, a primary drain runs through AMA, though it's the responsibility of Western Housing to um, get it filled or distributed, you know, we have to prompt them. Okay, so you spoke about attitudes and the fact that people throw rubbish into drains, but uh, this can also be blamed on the fact that waste collectors are not picking up waste from the various homes. People keep their uh, garbage for weeks and it remains there. So would you blame someone if they end up uh, throwing it in, in, the, in the drains during rains? When it comes to disposing of waste into drains, some people, it's not because uh, their waste is not collected. They don't, they don't even make their waste available to be collected because waste collection goes to some fees. The beneficiary of the service have to pay for their services and some people do not want to pay. I already want to mention some communities, but a lot of households do not want to pay for waste collection services. So they dump either into drains or open spaces or caves. And then some, uh, some places too, because they don't want to pay the right amount, they engage uh, junkies. And then these uh, informal collectors, because they charge a uh, lower fees, so they collect the waste from these households and then dump them either in drains or open spaces. So, yeah, attitude is also... Is a but that is why there are bylaws, there are sanitation bylaws that should work in enforcing and then making sure that these people do not go scotch free and also have their way in doing what they want. Yeah, they are being enforced, but maybe the speed that you expect the enforcement to be done might be uh, the issue, because... Why? Because, in fact, uh, the, the officer doing this enforcement, in terms of the numbers, is not, not enough, it's not adequate. We will have very few um, environmental officers who are doing uh, this enforcement. The whole AM, we have less than 1,000 environmental health officers. Meanwhile, our population is close to 2 million, it's, it's over 2 million. So if we have um, just this number doing enforcement, you know, uh, the coverage is quite uh, problematic. So most of these measures you spoke about are reactionary. Instead of being preventive, you wait. When the things happen, then you are all over the place pretending to be working. We are not pretending to be working. Are you working? We, st we are working. We started the switching as far back as April, even before the rain set in. So why are we still seeing the same problems? We started uh, the switching long before the rain set in. It's not, it's not really reactionary. Yeah, I mean, we have been very proactive. We decided most of the rain before the rain even started. But you know, if you decide downstream, and then the uh, debris is carried from upstream, where you don't even have jurisdiction over, you know, there's nothing that you, you can do. Because it's seated and then it's seated again. So, so what you have to do, you have to continue the, the sitting, even during the, even during the rains. Which, which parts of Accra? Because yesterday, for instance, we visited some areas and we didn't see anybody working. There was no sign of the AMA working there. Yeah, for example, if you go to Accra Academy area, we are working on the drains over there. And then um, if you desist, we started the sitting in April. If you desist a drain and it's not seated, you cannot leave your machine there. Because it costs over... It costs close to 2,000, uh, over 2,000 Ghana cities to keep um, a small excavator on site. So once the drain is deceited, why should you leave the machine there? So now that it has been, we have to go back and then where we've deceited and then it's seated again, we do the deceiting again. That's what they have to do. There are certain areas that are known for constant flood, even if it drizzles, the place will flood. And some areas, with or without rain, the place is always wet. Areas like Dansoman Junction, Dakuman, that straight, that place is always flooded. Some water running there, even when it's not raining. So what have you done about that situation as well? And there's going to be a reconstruction of that drain from um, Odoko Gloria Land area to Dansoma, uh, to, uh, Dansoma Junction to, to First Light. Because uh, it's a serious engineering problem that AMB is working on. It's working on. So the entire stretch is going, not only the Dansoma Junction, but the entire stretch from Gloria Land to uh, First Light. So very soon, uh, the First Light will be cut, just like what has been done at uh, Malam. But I don't be able to give you the timeline now. Uh, so it's a gradual thing that we are, we are doing. You know, engineering work, you cannot do it as and when. When you are tackling a stretch, you have to do the entire thing so that the solution will be holistic. And how soon? When exactly are you starting and finishing? It has started already. Because the, um, the Accra Academy um, drainage is part of that, the entire stretch. 
Accra Academy, Dakuma Junction, and then Dakuma Junction. So when you get to Dakuma Junction, you may see you may see two bus culverts over there. We have to cut uh, the road at that point and then install those culverts so that the uh, storm water flowing from the Uroko will not be impeded at uh, Dakuma Junction behind the total filling station. So it's an entire drainage work that we are doing there. Udoko, um, Udoko condition stretch. Yeah. Um, I will appeal to citizens to dispose waste in the former, within the former collection system. It doesn't pay to dispose of your waste in drains because it will not dissolve in the drain. It may end up somewhere and you might, in the, in the event of flood, you may be affected. So residents or citizens should not dispose of waste in drains. They have to pay for services so that when it's collected, it will be disposed at the right place. Thank you very much. So Mr. Victor Kote is the acting director of the Waste Management Department at the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. And we have been talking about flooding in Accra and what the assembly has been doing to try and bring the situation under control. You are still watching Captured by Women. Stay tuned. We have more stories. Nana Ikea Beme is the co-founder of Axenus, and Axenus is one of Ghana's leading architectural organizations. Their work environments that I've discovered, very exciting, very youthful, and very engaging. We're going to walk into her world and discover what makes her world how it is, and find out how she's journeyed on her path as an architect in a field that very few women in Ghana venture into. Stay tuned. All right, Nana. So that, that's a very impressive profile yeah. you have, and a very encouraging one as well, especially for young ones. Yeah. But developing or um, identifying what one really wants to do has been a very challenging task for many people yeah. in human development. In your case, how did it happen? At what point were you able to know that this is what I want to do? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I have always been an artist since I was um, very young. I was always uh, drawing. My parents' house suffered a lot. I'm drawing on the walls. I'm drawing everywhere. And um, I think for me, my parents identified it early and allowed me to explore that talent. And um, eventually... Um, haven't explored it. Of course, I never assumed I would be an architect. I had no clue what architecture was. But um, I was blackmailed by my mother. Really? <laughs> <laughs> to do architecture. So being the good girl that I am, I followed through. And eventually, of course, it turns out mother knows best. Because for me, um, being an architect, my talent as an artist mm. is, is really what drives um, what I do. And so, yes, I didn't have a choice but to go to university to do architecture. Mm. There's a notion that you would have to get certain certain schools. Some, yeah. Sometimes school abroad, abroad. get kind of exposure know. to you know? where you are now. Yeah. How did it play out for you yes. in your education and other uh, enterprises before yeah. you got yeah. here? So, I do get that a lot in my line of work. Did you train here? Did you... and I, I, it's actually, I'm proud always to say, yes, I trained here fully from A to Z. I haven't schooled anywhere outside of Ghana. My siblings have. I had the opportunity to, but for some reason, I always felt like I needed to do this. I needed to also prove to myself, maybe, that really, you don't need to. It's not everybody that can have that opportunity, but does that mean that's the end of your um, your dream. vision, your dream, whatever. No, it should not be. I haven't gone to school anywhere but here. But of course, you, ought, you take advantage of exposure. So now, uh, tell us about Axenos. Yes. And how big you have become. How it all started. And the challenges yeah, we you big. Said, Very big. <laughs> very big, Nana. So when, when you finally, after all the schools, the exposure, yeah. everything, mm. then you sat down and decided, well, this is what I'm going to do. Mm. How did this start? The challenges, because okay. I'm sure there was oh, a host yes, of a lot. them. Yes. Interestingly, I didn't start by saying I'm going to do this. Um, life happened. So I was working in an office I loved. Um, had no reason to leave. 
but like I said, life happened. I was going to get married, I was going to have children. The work environment was not going to accommodate that. So I had to excuse myself. Of course, I continued to help out at my old office. And as I excused myself, um, I started just really literally doing um, whatever project comes my way, I'll do it. Eventually, I guess we became too, um, it became too invasive to be doing this from the dining table. So we didn't have a choice but to find a space to start operating from and basically so you know the the typical story and it's so real that literally every every business starts from a dining table somewhere we'll be hearing more about that soon and <laughs> I, I want you to take us round let's right. have a feel of axinos and the female dominated oh. working area and then unconscious successes unconsciously tell us, tell us about this award yes so um last year they they scouted for there was a call for um, nominations of people under 40 who are excelling in their fields and I guess I was nominated and then at the event I, I was called to be a winner of one of the 40 so 40 under 40 achievers from 26 17 yes. these are project specific so this is Tower Cascade this is a 10 story apartment building we are doing in Jowolu um, that we entered into a comp an award scheme and we won. Mm -hmm. That actually went on um, and then we have Imperial Zambang is a hotel in Tamale mm -hmm. um, coming up. Uh, Shell is finished, we are doing finishing now. Very interesting one. That went on to win a five star award. Maybe you want to tell us something about those who aspire to be like yes. you and so we can do that also on the All other right. side. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are here enjoying some fresh air. Yeah. At least we take you off the intensity inside. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. so what do you do to, to relax or wind down? <laughs> or <What> wind? Do <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I... Hmm. There are so many things I like to do, but I mean, life happens. <laughs> I, I used to go out, I used to, I mean, still we try. My mm. friends, they all have kids now. And before we plan one out thing, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm telling you. But I mean, whenever we can, we try to hang out. I mean, my husband and I, we try every to now and then. to the club once a while. If need be, why not? You can still go <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> I wish oh, I had well. some music here oh, to, yeah. to try oh, yes. some boogie I like down. to dance. No yeah, doubt. I know. I like to dance. I know. Yes. <laughs> You like watching sports? We will have a lot of mail in no, your house now. I've tried my oh. best. I've tried my best. My husband is watching today. <laughs> I have tried my best to like football, but I, maybe I'm just I'm not. I'm just not wired for it. Yes, I, I see it's it's very active, but I, I haven't caught on unfortunately. Mm. Yes, but my children have now there. Yeah. So I'm in the minority in my house, as you so can imagine. You're not working, you are not at church. Yes. What would you do? Where would you find an area? I, I actually, what I, I, what I really enjoy, I like entertaining. I like to cook, invite people over, you know, entertain. I, I enjoy oh. entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> For people to yes, laugh. Yes, yes, I like to make people laugh. Oh. And then, yes, it's fun, just relax. Um, Generally, I, I love traveling as well. I love traveling, even though that still ties into work somehow. But yes, I, I like to travel, just get away from all of this and, and enjoy, especially with the kids, when we travel with the kids and it's, they really have us full time. <laughs> unlike, unlike the everyday, you know, then we really have that family bonding. It's, it's good, it's nice. Yes. Your last words on this whole career, professionalism, yeah. entrepreneurship, yeah. young ones coming up, especially women. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, not everybody also wants to be, um, to be working, to have to deal with all this. Some people to maybe their, their passion is for something else. Because making a home alone, it's, it's I, I, I admire people who are able to make, you know, really make a home. There's, there's people who are, you know, gifted like that. Whatever it is your passion is driving for, just give it a hundred percent. At the end of the day, it is the passion that will drive it. If yours is like me and you're an artist, you're in the profession, do it and do it well. Do it and do it with everything, and then and then you you will succeed. All right, so uh, it's been a great chat with 
a very great woman. We wow. are not celebrating <laughs> her because of her achievement, but we are generally trying to encourage women to pursue their dreams, pursue yeah. their uh, heartfelt passion. Mm -hmm. One thing that has run through our discussion is passion. Yeah. Just follow your passion. Follow and as you passion. said earlier, the money would come later. This has been a great chat with a very excellent woman who is excelling with four children and still counting. <laughs> oh, please. No, no counting. Are you done? <laughs> I'm I'm Are done. you sure? Oh, very much. So I can come next year. Oh, and very check please. please. Last time I checked, like, like, at least every year, yes, something, yes, something is dropped. Four is yes. enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see about that. We'll, we'll be coming here again to find out. But you are still watching Captured by Women. Indeed, yeah. we are capturing your whole Saturday afternoon by strong women yeah. making a difference in their field of work and wherever they find themselves. Enjoy the rest of the show. There is an interesting adage in the local parlance that says beauty is pain. Well, when we were young, we all wanted to grow up into that young lady who'd be rocking those high heels and holding that interesting bag. But now we hear the high heels just may be affecting our spine. Hmm, well, that doesn't sound too good, and I'm sure you are disappointed. But let's go out there and talk to a chiropractor. Maybe she'll give us some tips on how to at least manage those high heels and the handbags so we don't have too many issues with the spine. Let's go and watch that. Right, Dr. Maso, good afternoon and welcome to Captured by Women. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, and um, when we spoke, we had a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. about the fact that as women, some of the things we do actually exposes us to some dangers regarding our spine. And right. I would want you to give us some education about it because most women or almost every woman loves high heels. <laughs> our backs, we don't go without them. Mm -hmm. And so what are the health implications as far as our spines are concerned okay. in some of these things? Great, great question. Um, Catherine, the high heel thing is a big problem. Um, unfortunately, I see a lot of women who come in maybe in their 60s, 70s, and then they realize that they are having a lot of knee issues. And when I ask them, um, did you wear a lot of high heels before they retired? They'll say, yeah, you know. <laughs> so it is a problem. And the sad thing is that usually in the youthful um, years, you may not feel the pain, but once age starts catching up with you, then the problems start coming up. When we wear high heels, imagine you're walking on your toes. That's what we're doing when we wear high heels. So we're putting all our body weight on the toes. Then gravity is literally pushing down on you. So you have to buckle your knees. So your knees go in this way, then your waist area also has to compensate. Mm. So you realize that your entire body, it's not balanced because you're walking on your tippy toes. And over a long period of time, your joints get affected. Usually it would start with the ankle joints. So you may realize that at the end of the day, you have some pain around the ankles. You may not take it seriously. Eventually, you'll move up to the knees and then to the hip joints and then your spine. And once this whole cascade happens, a lot of things can go wrong in your body. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we, after taking off your shoes, you actually feel some pains beneath your feet. And then exactly. sometimes we put our feet in water. Exactly. And we are fine the next day. Exactly. And, we move on. and then you do it again and again and again. But um, it's not healthy. They say that anything one to two inches is okay. Once you get to three inches, every other inch, you're putting 20% more pressure on your body. Wow. So when we get That's to the scary. six inches, <laughs> yes. Wow. So by the time we get to five, six inches, you can imagine it's like you're carrying extra weight um, on yourself and it's not healthy. So your body's joints cannot even carry all that extra pressure. Mm. So what then can we do? Because we can also keep wearing flat shoes every time and everywhere. Yes. Um, so what I recommend, I recommend wedges that gives you a full support um, throughout the soul. Um, I, I recommend, you know, one to two inches, especially for work. 
you know, when you're walking up and down, you're climbing stairs in some cases, it's better to keep it simple. Mm. So, um, what about handbags? Because if I'm carrying it this way, mm -hmm. how does it affect my spine as well? Very good question. So a handbag is okay if it's light, okay? But once mm -hmm. there's too many things in it and the weight goes up, you realize that we hang it on the shoulder. Or even if you're holding it like this, you realize that you tend to do this a lot of the times mm -hmm. to help support that extra weight. Now, two things. Number one, there's a network of nerves that come out from here called the brachial plexus. Now, the brachial plexus is very, very important because it sends information from the brain to your arm and all the way into the hands. So when you put that heavy load here or you're holding your bag like that, you tend to impinge or put pressure on that brachial plexus. So with time, you can start to develop neck pain, mm. even headaches, shoulder problems, numbness and tingling. Somebody will come and say, oh, the pain is from my neck into my fingers. Those things are usually due to pressure on the nerves in this area. So again, um, keep it light as much as possible. Um, you should switch the sides. So don't only hang the bag or hold it on the left side. Sometimes you use the left, sometimes you can also switch and use the right. Mm. If you're talking about this side of the body, then I'm sure even wearing bra can also affect us. It can. Because some, some bras, you see some people in very a mark. Exactly, exactly. Especially for women who are very heavily um, endowed with the boobs, you realize that a lot of them have this type of pain in the upper back area because they would usually wear bras that are tight so that it can hold the boobs up and packaged yes very well. <laughs> packaged very well and in the long run they tend to have some of this um we call it pinched nerve in these areas yes now so sometimes you don't feel anything mm -hmm. like like i said earlier mm -hmm. You carry all the load, you wear the high heels, and you, I don't feel anything. Right. So why should I be bothered? Because right. not, no part of me is eaten. Exactly. And that's the dangerous one. Um, when you don't have any signs or symptoms that there's a problem. That's why I strongly recommend that at least once a year, everybody, women included, should have a spinal checkup. We usually will check our blood sugar, cholesterol, and all those things, but we don't tend to check the frame, okay? But your spine or your skeleton is literally your foundation that everything else is based off on. So if you don't check that regularly and there's something off, it's very, very um, difficult to know. Now, sometimes there are no signs, like we we're mentioning. I met a lady over the weekend and I said, oh, come in and let me check your spine. She's like, oh, just like you're saying, I don't have any problem. But I just did a quick visual and realized that she had a, a spinal misalignment. So she came in, I had her go do x-rays, and truly, voila, she did have quite a severe spinal abnormality. So we strongly recommend that even if you are not having any pain or any symptom, you should still have your spine checked. Mm. But lastly, at what point would I know without checking okay. that there's something wrong? with my spine okay. if I don't feel any pain as well. Okay. So sometimes you may not feel pain, but you may have what we call decreased range of motion. So for instance, you realize that you cannot turn your neck fully, or you realize that um, you're picking something from the floor, but it's difficult reaching the floor. Those are signs that there could be a spinal problem. Sometimes just looking or people looking at you will tell you, uh, it looks like like your shoulders are not straight or it looks like your head is bent over tilted over yes so all those are also signs that there could be something wrong sometimes even um, difficulty sleeping you don't sleep well you feel very tired or you feel stressed a lot of the times it comes from pressure in the neck area so if you're experiencing any of those things then we'll look very closely at what we call the cervical spine to see if everything is in the, its proper place over there mm. so 
if I find myself in the situation, for instance, maybe someone is already feeling the pain and all that, what's the remedy? So here at our office, we use mainly chiropractic to treat these problems. Now, um, we use our hands. It's a natural therapy, no drug, no medication. We look at x-rays. So when we look at somebody's x-ray, we can literally see what's happening in the spine. If this bone has shifted out this way or that way. Once we have that information, then very gently we use our hands to work on the spine to remove any nerve pressure from the area. Now, sometimes it takes a while. It's not a one-time thing, especially for women who may have gone through multiple pregnancies. They may have had accidents, falls. We might have to do the treatment for a while before the spine goes back to its proper place. We also complement that with massage, which helps your muscles to relax. And I strongly believe that every woman should have massage at least a couple of times a month. Mm -hmm. um, we also do some physiotherapy, which also goes a long way to help with the pain relief. Mm. So here at um, Nova, what does it take for anybody to come and have these services? So you just have to call us, book an appointment, and then you come in, you will do the initial consultation, find out your history, what is going on now, and then we'll, if, if need be, we'll send you to go do the x-rays. Once you bring the x-rays back, we look at it and then we tell you what our recommendations will be. Mm. So how do we find you? How accessible are you okay. in the capital? So we are right on the Kanda Highway. If you're coming from Gold House, um, once you go past the Kanda Overpass, there's a traffic light, fourth building after that traffic light, you see the Nova Wellness Center sign. Mm. Any contact? Are you on social media? We are. Um, our phone number is 26 995 We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us as Nova Wellness Center. All right. Nice. So your last words mm -hmm. on what we discussed so far. Okay. So I want to say that women should take their health very seriously. A lot of women get busy taking care of everybody else except themselves the kids the husband work and everything but if you as the woman of the house you're not healthy how do you ensure that your family is also healthy so i would say that um, let's give ourselves a little break and take extra steps to make sure that our health is optimal all right thank you very much thank you and you heard it for yourself i mean we love the high heels they make us look classy and all but we should also bear in mind what we may be doing to our spine it may not be today but definitely you're going to feel the pain sometime in your lifetime and that is why you should also take steps to correct anything that may be happening behind your back you're still watching captured by women we are back with more please stay So ladies, we're wrapping up the show. Yeah. Um, aside the lifestyle, we also talked about the Meteo Agency engaging more with the media and being proactive than being reactive in, mm. in situations like flooding. And uh, what else did we look at today? Well, we uh -huh. saw Nanika Berme as well, mm. that architect. Mm. Oh my goodness. Well, she happens to be the wife of a doctor colleague. Oh, Korean. okay. And I mean, she's, she's a good mother. She's a great mother, mm. architect and all that. And I think she's doing very well mm. in her field. Mm. Congrats to them. All the women take a cue from that. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and there was also the issue of um, the lifting of the ban on small yes. scale mining. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> how I feel about it, mm. but really there's the, the conversation that we have to have around the environmental degradation that it causes. Mm. But I feel that listening to the, the director of research and development from the association, they, they, they sort of have a plan right. and um, I feel that if we're able to engage and implement the plan, especially the roadmap that the president has uh, outlined, we should be able to see some improvements in the environment and the issues around it because mm -hmm. it, it does have a huge impact. It so does. Okay. It certainly yeah. does. So it's been a very great show. Um, we know that you've learned a lot, as we have. Please join us same time next week uh, for another informative edition. Bye.